Hey, welcome back. It's time to begin our exploration of maybe the single most powerful feature in Excel's arsenal, pivot tables. So what the heck is a pivot table? In short, it's a tool for rapidly summarizing and analyzing data, with no formulas required. Pivot tables especially shine when it comes to quickly gleaning insights from large data sets, those with far more distinct records or data points than we could possibly reason about without some help from Excel's massive computer brain. But there's a kicker. Pivot tables are picky about how your data is structured. If you want to analyze a data set with pivot tables, it must be organized in a tabular fashion. That is to say, with columns containing distinct types of data and column headers describing those columns. This is a small price to pay though, and honestly that's how you should be organizing your data 99% of the time anyway. Now I could keep going on and on about how awesome pivot tables are, but they're really more of a show kind of feature versus a tell kind of feature. So let's go ahead and get some hands-on practice using pivot tables. So here we have our sample call center data set that has a variety of statistics pertaining to calls received at a call center. It also contains a number of categorical or non-numeric fields that describe or categorize each data point in a certain way. For example, in column J, the employee name, which is the name of the employee who took the call, the site where that employee works, the manager of the employee, and the type of call that was taken. Applying a pivot table to this data set will allow us to combine quantitative metrics like call duration in minutes and abandoned calls with categorical fields like employee name and site in ways that will give us quick insights into this very large data set, which ranges almost to 100,000 records. So how do we create the pivot table? Well, there are a couple ways we can go about it, but my preference is first to select the data set that we're going to analyze with our pivot table, and then insert the pivot table once the data is selected. Now note here that it is crucial to include the column headers in the data you're selecting. Every aspect of the process of analyzing data with a pivot table will revolve around the concept of our data being organized into columns. So having column headers and descriptive names in those column headers is key. So with that said, let me go ahead and select our entire data set, which I'll do using control shift right arrow, control shift down arrow. And now to insert the pivot table, I'll go to the insert tab on the ribbon and then click the pivot table button all the way over on the left. And now you see in this dialog box that Excel recognizes that we've already selected the range of cells that we want to analyze with the pivot table. And you can also see that using an external data source is an option, and that's something we'll look at a little bit later. Now the second choice that Excel presents us with is where we want our pivot table report to be placed, in a new worksheet or the existing worksheet. Most of the time you're going to want to place your pivot table in a brand new worksheet because the data you're analyzing is taking up so much space on the other worksheet, it really wouldn't make sense for you to try to put both in one place. So we'll leave the default of New Worksheet and then click OK. And over here on the right, you see what we can think of as the command center for our pivot table. First, there's a list of all the fields in our data, which Excel was able to recognize because we organized our data into columns and named those columns with column headers. And then down below that list of fields, we see four empty squares, one for filters, one for columns, one for rows, and one for values. And Excel is telling us that we can drag fields between those areas. So I'm not going to explain what all four of these areas are for right away. Instead, I think it's more constructive to just go ahead and drag one of our fields into one of those areas so you can see how it works. So I think I'll grab my site field and I'll drag it into the rows area at the bottom left. And now what we see is that a list of the unique values in our site column, which is to say our three sites, has been inserted into our blank worksheet. So by itself, that doesn't seem terribly useful. I mean, couldn't we have gotten a list of distinct values just by using the remove duplicates feature, for example? Well, yes, but this is a crucial first step to data analysis because typically 
your analysis is going to involve breaking down your data set into different categories and then comparing summary metrics among those categories. And in order to compare categories, we first need a unique list of those categories. If we want to compare our three sites, we first have to have just those three sites listed side by side. So the key thing to remember is, whenever you drag a field from our data into either the rows area, or, and I'm getting ahead of myself here just slightly, the columns area, Excel will automatically display just the unique values from that column, no matter how many records the data set has. So now is where we can actually begin our analysis. So let's say we want to know how many calls were taken at each of our sites. So what we'll do is drag, say, the call ID field into the values area. And keep in mind that by drag, I mean that I'm hovering over that field in the fields list, clicking and holding my mouse button, and then dragging down to that values area. So now I hope that you're getting the gist of how this works. Excel is attempting to apply a summary calculation of the values in our call ID field broken out by the unique values in the site field. The only problem here is the calculation Excel applied by default just doesn't make a lot of sense. If we go back to our raw data worksheet, we see that while call ID is a number, it's not really something that makes sense to try to aggregate statistically. Call IDs are just that. They're, they're unique identifiers. They're not meant to be summed or averaged. What we really want to do here is just count the call IDs so that no more weight is assigned to the 50,000th call ID than to the first. So let's go back to our pivot table and then click this arrow to the right of call ID in our values area. And then we'll choose value field settings. And right away you can see the problem. Excel guessed that we wanted to sum the values in that field because they were numeric. It just wasn't smart enough to recognize that while those fields were numbers, it really wasn't meaningful to try to add them. So instead, we're going to choose count and then click OK. And there we have it, a breakout of the number of calls taken by each site. Now, I wouldn't blame you for thinking this all looks a little magical and being a little skeptical about the accuracy of these numbers. So let me prove it to you. Let's take note of the number of calls at the Jacksonville, Florida site. 35,562. Now let's go back to our data worksheet and apply filters to our data set. And now I will filter for just our Jacksonville site. And if you look down to our status bar at the bottom left, it says 35,562 records found. So I hope at this point you'll believe that the other two numbers are accurate as well. Now if you want to see the detailed data behind any of these numbers in the pivot table, you don't have to go to the trouble of filtering the source data set. Instead, you can use pivot tables drill down feature to get to that detailed data in literally two clicks of your mouse. So if I just double click this number here associated with the Jacksonville, Florida site, Excel automatically generates a table with just those records pertaining to that particular group. And if we click the filter button on the site column, you'll see that the only site in this data set that was generated is Jacksonville, Florida. And then if I click in my first row of data and then control shift down arrow to select all the way to the bottom, you'll see in our status bar, we have a count of 35,562 records, once again proving that Excel only included records pertaining to that particular site in our generated data set here. So I'll go ahead and delete this sheet that was generated. And now lastly, I'll show that you are not limited to adding just one metric to your pivot table. Let's say we want to break out a couple other summary statistics by site. For example, maybe we want to see a count of abandoned calls by site. So if I scroll down to find call abandoned among our pivot table fields, and then just drag that down to the values section, we'll see that not only does the metric slot in neatly next to our previous one, but this time Excel's guess that we wanted to apply a sum calculation to the values does make sense. If we go back to the call abandoned field in our source data, you can see that every record has a value of one or zero. 
with one indicating that a call was abandoned and zero indicating that it was not. So by simply summing all of the ones, we effectively get a count of all the abandoned calls for that particular site. Just to reiterate, and again using the Jacksonville, Florida site as an example, Excel is basically saying, first, let's only consider records in our source data set where the site is equal to Jacksonville. And then for our first metric, let's count those records. And then for our second metric, let's sum all the values in that call abandoned field. So if I were to again go back to my data set, and with a filter of Jacksonville, Florida already applied to my site column, if I then apply a filter of 1 to my call abandoned column, Excel tells me that 2,154 records were found. And if I navigate back to my pivot table, that's exactly the number we see for our sum of call abandoned metric. So while we're at it, I'll throw in one more metric, which I think will be call duration in minutes. Now in this case, a simple sum of all the minutes that all the agents at each of our sites spent on the phone isn't that interesting. What I would instead like is an average of how long those calls took. So I again need to change the default calculation that Excel chose for this metric. So let me scroll down to the value section until I see our sum of call duration, and then click our little arrow, and then go to value field settings. And now I'll change the type of calculation applied to this field to average, and then click OK. And now we can see that the employees at our various sites are fairly consistent in terms of how long they take to finish a call. It's roughly 12 minutes per site. So before we go, let's just reiterate the basic structure for our pivot table here. Categorical data, typically non-numeric things like the names of call center sites or employee names, will usually go into the rows or columns area of our pivot table. Then, numeric values to which we can apply statistical calculations typically go in our values section. And then those fields will be summarized statistically by the unique values in whatever columns we dragged into our rows or columns area. And then lastly, I'll point out that there's this weird pseudo column that has appeared in our columns area. So this values pseudo column basically just means that our summarized values are appearing as columns in our pivot table. The count of calls is in the first column, the average of call duration is in the second column, and the sum of abandoned calls is in the third column. Okay, so we've already done a lot with pivot tables, but there is so, so much more that we can do. We've really just scratched the surface. Up next, we'll look at how we can add even more layers to our pivot table analysis. I'll see you then.